Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Miranda Melcher, and I'm so pleased today to be joined by Dr. Linda Kinsler to tell us all about her book just published from Public Affairs titled Come to This Court and Cry. Um, This is a dramatic title, a very gets us kind of right into a whole bunch of things that this book examines, among others, what is history? How does it get changed, distorted over time? What gets remembered? What gets forgotten? Why? Um, What role the law has played in this and continues to play in it today, um, even in ways that we might not expect? So Linda, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast to tell us all about your book. Thank you so much for having me. Before we do get into your book, would you mind introducing yourself a bit and explaining why you decided to write this? Happily. Um, I am a writer and scholar. I have been a journalist for over 10 years now, covering um, almost everything, but mainly European politics and Uh, foreign affairs. Um, I spent several years covering the war in Ukraine. Um, And as a scholar, I um, have just completed my PhD at UC Berkeley in the rhetoric program there, uh, studying the kind of intersection of uh, law, history, and memory. And I decided to write this book actually... um, during grad school at the University of Cambridge when I came across the news that there was a very strange prosecution ongoing in Latvia, uh, which is where my family emigrated from in 1988. They went from Riga to the United States along with many other Soviet Jews at that time. Uh, And so I had always been kind of curious about this place. I had returned to it many times growing up. I was taught Latvian as a child and grew up speaking Russian at home. And so I was kind of immersed in this process of rediscovering my own family history as I was kind of coming into myself, I would like to think, as a scholar and thinker. And um, this discovery kind of set me on that path. Well, so we have to obviously then start with that discovery. Um, Can you please introduce us to the legal case that first got you interested in writing this book? Yes. Um, I mean, as with many things, it just kind of came about as I was reading the newspaper headlines. I, uh, at the time, I was studying Ukrainian literature and history at Cambridge, as I said, and I was kind of traveling to the region a bunch and I kind of was reading the Latvian daily newspapers and I saw, you know, I wasn't kind of moving about completely naively, you know, I was interested in my own family history and um, my mother's family were, you know, Soviet Jews originally from Ukraine who then were moved to Riga, Latvia. And there she met my father who uh, is Latvian and had his family had been there for many years and his father had disappeared after World War II and we never really knew what happened to him. Um, although in subsequent years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, rumors had begin to, begun to kind of swirl that not only he had he belonged to one of the local collaborationist SS units, which was called the RS Commando, but also that he had been a KGB agent after the war before he kind of disappeared with no trace. Um, and so I was beginning to think about how I, as a journalist, might go about investigating this strange disappearance at the heart of my family story. And it was along the way, as I was researching this unit called the RIS Commando, which was one of the most brutal killing units of the Holocaust in Eastern Europe, that I discovered the case that is really at the center of the book, which involves a man named Herbert Sukers. Um, Some listeners might know his name um, because he 
was originally known as the Latvian Lindbergh. He was a very famous pilot in pre-war or in uh, interwar Latvia, that is, um, during the nation's first bout of independence. He, you know, was one of the kind of pioneering aviators of that time. And his face was very easily recognized in the newspapers. He fancied himself a journalist. Um, and he later then joined this killing commando. Um, and because he was so well known, his victims recognized his face uh, in the Riga ghetto. Uh, and he met a kind of strange and spectacular end. He was murdered in 1965, killed by Mossad agents who were operating undercover um, in Uruguay. Uh, he was kind of a successor case to the Eichmann trial, which I find endlessly fascinating. And as I was reading the Riga tabloids, I think this was in 2015, I discovered that Zuckers, who had been assassinated in 1965, was in fact the subject of a posthumous criminal investigation in Latvia. And what was at issue was whether he could be said to have perpetrated or participated in uh, the genocide in Riga. And I was immediately struck. I thought, how is this possible? You know, first of all, how could they be questioning his culpability, which is quite well documented? And second of all, how could a man who was killed in 1965 be proverbially on the dock? Yeah, that, that was my question. Um, starting the book, I was like, hang on a second. There is a lot to unpack here. Um, what exactly is going on? So um, obviously in the book, you've done it in masterful detail. Hopefully we'll get a decent sort of highlights tour of it in our discussion. Um, and the place I'd like to sort of start with that is kind of by definition, if there's a case happening now about things in World War II, that suggests to me at least that that kind of discussion, persecution, reconciliation, whatever you want to call it, whatever route you want to go down, didn't happen then. Why not? If they were the most brutal killing group going around, why was persecuting perpetrators in and around Riga not something that happened until more recently? Right. So there's many ways of answering this question. Um, and the first, you know, which I do talk about at length in the book is that it did happen to some extent to, you know, we can debate about um, to what extent it was, you know, productive of justice, certainly, or a vengeance. Um, but what I explore in the book is the many ways in which um, at this like immediate post-war and even, you know, during the war, in these moments where people were really desirous of understandably achieving um, reckoning for these crimes, how they constructed trials. And, you know, one of the things I discovered during this book is that uh, Riga was the site of what was called the Little Nuremberg, um, which is one of the kind of first of the Soviet-run trial of um, of Nazis who had overseen the killings in Riga, one of whom was Friedrich Yekjan, and um, he was kind of hung unceremoniously uh, 24 to 48 hours after the trial began. It was a very speedy uh, procedure. Uh, and, you know, he was hung in the public square and people kind of cheered that moment. Um, and... Victor Zareis, you know, the man who led the Zareis commando, he escaped justice for many years and was only later found living under a pseudonym, kind of a really thinly constructed one in Germany and uh, lived out his days in a West German prison. Um, and what I found was that, you know, first of all, in those immediate post-war moments, the perpetrators 
did everything they could to disappear. You know, there were a lot of men who were unaccounted for conspicuously. Uh, and there was a lot of questioning about whether they were still alive. Where were they? People were filtered out. You know, um, a lot of the perpetrators and collaborators feared the Soviets most of all. And that was their excuse for, in some cases, for joining the SS units. And so they fled West. They Some of them managed to disappear into DP camps, um, even going so far as to present themselves as victims, of course. Um, and a lot of them were in custody at various times and were released. Uh, and Sukers was kind of ahead of this curve. He fled with his family as the war was ending, presenting himself as someone who was fleeing from the Soviet takeover of the Baltic states. And you know, he had a Jewish woman who was living with his family throughout the war, who he saved from the Riga ghetto, who traveled with his family uh, on a ship full of Jewish refugees uh, to South America, where he built a life. And uh, not only was his name entered into evidence during the Nuremberg trials, but also during the Eichmann trial, um, where we have the testimonies of survivors of the Riga ghetto who were able to utter what he participated in during that time. The parallel you've already raised with the Eichmann trial, and of course, this story begins to sound a bit familiar, right? The fleeing to Argentina, the having different names, the etc. You're kind of like, okay, great. So why aren't we talking about a second Eichmann trial? Why was the Mossad team that went to find him, why did they kill him rather than bring him to trial? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that's really the kind of animating question that drove me to, you know, first of all, go to Uruguay and um, not only see the site of the assassination, but also to kind of speak with the um, police archivists who still maintain the evidence for, that was collected at the time of the killing. You know, the Zuckers' body was left in this trunk. Uh, and, you know, as a journalist and a scholar, it's important to go see your primary sources. And so I wanted to go see the trunk, see the site. Um, and it kind of ironically, only the top of the trunk is left and the rest of it was kind of thrown out because some archivists at some point didn't realize what it was and just kind of threw it away. Uh, but in what is left, you can still see the blood marks that were left. And um, it's so interesting because in Hannah Arendt's you know, infamous account of the Eichmann trial, there are several moments that I was returning to often at, during my investigation. And one of them is when she kind of raises the question of why Mossad bothered to kidnap and transport Eichmann to Israel for this kind of grand proceeding, you know, this world historical trial that was so important for cementing uh, the new law of the state of Israel at that time. And she wonders, you know, why they bothered, why they didn't just kill him in Argentina and kind of save themselves all the trouble. And so in the Zucker's case, we have a, you know, we have the answer, essentially. Uh, the One of the agents who was in charge of logistics for the Eichmann operation was put in charge of the Sukers case. And so it was he who kind of led the operation, who spent many, many months, uh, you know, working in their, under a disguise, earning Sukers' trust such that he would um, allow himself to be kind of lured to what would be the side of his killing. Um, and, you know, as I write in the book, the Mossad agents left a... Uh, you know, excerpt of the closing speech of Sir Hartley Shawcross at the Nuremberg Tribunal on top of his body before they left. Um, and that speech, which also gives me the title of the book, uh, pertains primarily to the crimes that were committed on the Baltic states, you know, the Holocaust by bullets that occurred prior to the infrastructure of concentration camps. Um and then it was only later when they had successfully kind of fled Uruguay 
that they sent a verdict for Zuckers in the form of a telegram to the kind of news bureaus in Germany. And it, you know, it took a judicial form. It was so interesting to me that they, it was important to them to say this was, you know, obviously extrajudicial on its face, but it was important to them to locate it in a kind of in the language of justice, you know, this is the verdict. This is why we killed him. They said he was responsible for the murders of 30,000 Jews in Latvia. Um, and he deserved to die for his crimes. And here is where his body is located. And indeed, when the journalists sent the police to look, that's how they found him. So you might think then that the story would end there. After all, he's now dead. Uh, the body's been found. There's a very clear who did it and why. And yet you talk about how Sukers becomes a, quote, lively dead body. Mm -hmm. How? Why? What's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, as first of all, I should say they didn't. Um, the question of who killed him wasn't immediately clear, although, of course, people suspected uh, the verdict that was sent in the telegram form was signed those who will never forget. Um, and it's so interesting to me how, you know, in that gesture alone, the relation between forgetting memory and justice is already entangled. And, you know, as I write in the book, one of the questions that continues to kind of animate me and frustrate me is, um, the provocation of Yosef Haim Yerushalmi in his postscript to Zahor, which is his um, kind of uh, masterful book on Jewish memory, you know, in which he says, maybe the antonym to forgetting isn't memory, maybe it is justice. Um, and I like, I, you know, it's hard not to read this event in those terms. Uh, you know, they were kind of, professing that they would never forget his crimes and also ensuring that he met the ultimate end. Um, and that he, of course, would not have to remember anything because he would be dead. Um, so when I write that he became a lively dead body, you know, this assassination had a lot of reverberating effects. First of all, it was, you know, for a short time, an international sensation. You know, people around the world wanted to know who did it and why and who this man was. So it made him kind of immediately a subject of interest. And then it kind of died away. But because it was, you know, because there was no trial, there was no kind of official proceeding, there was no real verdict, uh, this kind of, it created an opening through which efforts at revisionism were allowed to flourish. And I think, you know, when we look at other perpetrators, such as Victor Zaris, his boss, who met a very ignominious end, but he did have a public trial and proceeding and he died in prison, there's no similar cult of revisionism around him. Um, and similarly with Friedrich account, you know, like we don't see these um, cults of personalities around people who did have trials. You know, we can debate the shortcomings of these proceedings uh, forever, but it is the fact that they do play an important role in shutting down opportunities for denialism that we have seen occur in other cases. So when I write that, you know, he became a lively dead body, it's because he didn't have this, for whatever reason, um, kind of official judicial proceeding. And the term is from Catherine Vergery, the anthropologist who um, wrote that Eastern Europe was the site of what she says are, you know, quote, uncommonly lively dead bodies, uh, that it was this place where particularly after the collapse of the Soviet world, that there was a lot of corpse politics, that there was um, a lot of debate over who these people had been and who could claim them. Um, and I think throughout the former Soviet world, we've seen instances in which, you know, these uh, former like nationalist figures have been with kind of unseemly affiliations have been reclaimed in the present. And, you know, you could, I think the closest analog is Stefan Bandera in Ukraine, 
Um, and so I was interested in tracking how Tsukers' body and afterlife had been reconfigured, shifted, reclaimed, and indeed revived, not only through this criminal prosecution that he was all of a sudden subject to in 2015, but also through this kind of really strange profusion of cultural artifacts that I found. Uh, You know, there was a musical about his life that, you know, passed absolutely no judgment on him. Um, There were films, there was a museum exhibit called The Presumption of Innocence, and all of these things were meant to uh, bring into question the kind of hard-won certainty about how the Holocaust was perpetrated in the Baltic states. Um, and of course, there was also a novel, uh, this kind of spy novel, which I found in the Riga bookstore after the prosecutor told me to go look at it because my grandfather, he said, was one of its main characters. And so I was kind of very quickly after I started looking into this, I felt like I was um, almost losing my mind, you know, or kind of living in this strange Philip Roth novel where my disappeared grandfather was all of a sudden not only a protagonist in this really strange nationalistic spy novel in which he is framed for the murder of Zuckers, but also a person of interest also in Zuckers' Uh, criminal investigation. Um, And the book is my effort at trying to get my coordinates coordinates in this very strange historical and juridical landscape. So I found it absolutely fascinating to read about those things you mentioned, right? The play, the novel, etc. And this kind of wider idea of a revisionist renaissance. Why do you think this has developed and is developing? Yeah, I mean, I want to, whenever I talk about this, I just want to be careful because I don't want it to make it seem that it's, you know, overtaking the entire country. But I also, you know, we have to pay attention as scholars to these kinds of artifacts because of what they could mean. And so it's, um, my way of answering this question is looking at the kind of you know, something like an imposition of memory that occurred uh, around, you know, the 90s and early 2000s when Latvia and um, neighboring countries became independent once again and, you know, were looking to join the European Union. And during that process, one of the things that was expected was, you know, a real memorial culture of atonement for complicity in the Holocaust, which was very long overdue. You know, even though the Soviets had constructed many monuments, they never specifically mentioned the Jewishness of those who were killed. Um, You know, all the memorials were built to Soviet citizens of scholars of this field know very well. Um, And so I think that this revisionist move comes as a reaction to what was perceived as a kind of memory imposed from abroad, a kind of dictation of what these new nations should atone for, you know, a kind of other, a new form of empire in a way. Uh, And so it was framed very clearly to me by the author of the spy novel that Zuckers was a way of talking about independent Latvia and by reclaiming him and pardoning him for his alleged collaboration, which is very well documented, that it was also a way of expiating the nation of its supposed complicity. Um, And I think it was also a way of repositioning uh, Latvia as um, a place that was primarily opposed to the Soviet and now Russian threat, which is, you know, of course, right now, the primary uh, concern. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think it's important, as you said, to have that context, be aware of it, but not over kind of go too far into it, right? So that nuance is important. Um, Speaking about the legal case in particular, would you mind taking us through what the prosecutor actually decided, um, or at least initially, and what the reaction was? Yeah, I mean, it was so fascinating because, you know, I had this, 
first meeting with him in the general prosecutor's office in Riga. And, you know, I presented myself as a journalist and we had corresponded over email a bit and they had asked me about my last name and if I was related to um, Boris Kinsler, my grandfather, whom they said was a person of interest in the case. Uh, and I said, yes. And they asked me if I had any documentation. And I, you know, I told them the truth that I, you know, we don't have anything really. Um, and when I first kind of discovered it, it was an ongoing investigation that had not yet been decided, as you said, for the first time. Um, and the question was almost this, it was being treated as any other kind of murder case would be today, right? The question was, can he be, can Sukers be viewed as criminally complicit in the killing of Jews? In Riga, there were, um, and the, the nights of interest were specifically surrounding the mass shootings uh, in the Rumbula Forest right outside of Riga. Um, and he told me, you know, they had petitioned many of the relevant nations for information, you know, Germany, Israel, the United Kingdom, Russia, of course, uh, but also Brazil and Uruguay for whatever records they had um, and were kind of conducting their own investigation into this historic event and not you know, coming up short, essentially, they were, they were pouring through victim testimony or survivor testimony. Uh, and there were, it was this kind of forensic procedure of trying to figure out if he could have been shown to have pulled the trigger, right? It was without a doubt that he had been present at the site of the massacres. But there was this obsession with trying to understand uh, if he had shot a gun at someone himself. And that to me uh, was, you know, hard to fathom. But then of course, you know, for anyone involved with anyone kind of with a legal background, it's very unsurprising if disappointing in this context. Um, because, you know, in Germany, they have just, they have built, uh, after the war, they built this infrastructure of criminal prosecution called the crime complex, which I talk about, where all you have to show is that membership in the perpetrator group, um, because it was very clear that you weren't going to get, you couldn't identify precisely, you know, those who uh, wielded all of the weapons because the weapons were those of like state infrastructure. And here it was very different. It was being treated, as I said, as just an ordinary criminal case and therefore kind of opened the pathway to, towards a essential pardon uh, or rehabilitation, which is what the case truly was. And the prosecutor originally ruled that the evidence was insufficient, that there was no um, corpus delicti, you know, no body of the crime, which is a legal term to say, well, we can't find a murdered body here. So therefore, we can't prosecute a murder, uh, which, of course, if you're thinking about the Holocaust is very sinister indeed, given all the efforts to destroy and erase the evidence. Uh, and so it was, you know, the Jewish community in Riga, who were my interlocutors all along, were understandably outraged by this verdict uh, or decision and, you know, that viewed it as kind of scandalous and unconscionable and immediately appealed. Uh, and their first appeal was rejected and their second one was accepted on the grounds that the prosecutor hadn't viewed all of the available evidence. And what they did was they found the last living survivors, first of all, and also their descendants who were asked to testify on behalf of of their dead parents. And I'll ask you about kind of what happened or a, a little bit about that in a moment, but I'd love to pick up on something you just mentioned, um, how in Germany there were kind of legal structures created to prosecute perpetrators um, through criminal law. Uh, at the time, that was obviously very innovative and allowed for a lot of um, prosecutions that may not have otherwise been possible, as you've just sort of described. 
from the distance now looking at it today, I think you've sort of hinted at what some of the benefits of that sort of thing might be. But I wonder if we can talk a bit more about kind of assessing that innovation and that outcome now that we have a bit of distance on it. Yeah, I mean, it's an, it's a really interesting question. And in part, like, it's a bit, I think we're right now, what I find so interesting about this moment is that we are now in a position to make assessments, you know, first of all, the, um, the Center for the, the Prosecution of National Socialist Crimes, which is what it's called in Germany, uh, is still open and ongoing and pursuing prosecutions, although um, I believe they only have a couple of years of funding left. Um, so the crime complex continues, you know, and I followed the German prosecutors who were seconded to this unit as they went to South America themselves to, to check the, you know, the ship registers in the old port of Buenos Aires. They were pouring over these lists of passengers to see who fit demographically uh, into some into the kind of parameters of someone who might have escaped prosecution for collaboration and complicity. Um, and what it allowed them to do is cast a much wider net and to proceed with uh, kind of greater speed and less trepidation. Um, and I think, you know, in other nations, these prosecutions have been kind of few and far in between, um, which, you know, we can talk about why that might be. Um, and I think the thing that most disturbs me at this particular moment is that the question about why these prosecutions are ongoing and why law is still the site where we are looking for to for for vengeance really for justice um and the jewish community were also kind of dismayed at this you know they thought it was a settled historical matter as far as they were concerned because historians had indeed already rendered verdicts um the kind of historical judgment about Sukhurs' complicity and about the role of um, Latvia had been settled. And now the law was kind of revisiting these instances of historical judgment and cracking them open once again and subjecting them to legal logic, which, as we know, is much harsher and less capacious, you know, and there's that famous line from Richard Evans, you know, why the law will not prove a thousand murders where it can prove a hundred, right? So it creates this natural gap for revisionism to enter. Um, and that is really what I find infuriating. And we find, we've seen it kind of accelerating. Uh, listeners might be familiar with the case that was levied against um, the historians Barbara Engel King and Jan Grabowski a couple years ago for their similar historical investigation into the complicity of a dead man, uh, in that case, a Polish mayor who whose rights as a deceased man had to be protected, you know? So I think there's a lot of contortion of judicial procedure ongoing now for uh, kind of uh, unsavory ends. And do you think that the sort of um, fury, the indignation, the the fear, it, are, are those the reasons you think people like um, David Libkin, other, you know, members of the Jewish community have been so invested in this case? I mean, certainly indignation. I think it's also a matter of, you know, honor and obligation to protecting a history that has been really hard won um, and also kind of shoring up the testimonies of survivors because um, that is the target, right? I mean, the second that, you know, I think in our, a lot of effort um, has been wonderfully expended to collecting as many testimonies as possible. Um, before the last survivors leave us. 
And I think we all are now faced with the question of what do we do with these testimonies, right? How do we ensure that they don't just kind of decay sitting there on the shelf um, and that the claims they make don't decay with them, you know, because that's the opening that these uh, prosecutions are exploiting. Um, and, you know, in Jewish tradition, there's this teaching that, you know, your, your, your memory doesn't really die until the last person stops telling your story, right? So there's this kind of obligation to continue that form of knowledge and to carry it on and to protect it. So I think that's what's ongoing. Um, and for me, I was also just kind of thinking about, I had studied kind of what is called forensic architecture, which is this field of using the testimony of inanimate objects and artifacts to get to the bottom of a crime. And I'm really interested in the application of forensic procedure to historical crimes, uh, because I think that is the moment where you do see quite a bit of perversion um, insofar as it doesn't clarify what we can discover and rather tends to make it more opaque. Which is tricky to grapple with, right? Yeah. <laughs> so given the complexity of this, the nuance and the indignation, what do you hope people, readers, listeners take away from this book? I mean, I, I think so much. I mean, honestly, I think we are in this time when so much has been written about this period in history and at the all, at the same time it's not enough right um we need to figure out a new way of dealing with all this memory and i was trying to propose one avenue perhaps you know i think and also just a way of thinking about, okay, what do we do if we're at the end of legal judgment? I think for the last 70 years, we've been really leaning hard on the courts to kind of tell us how to reckon with this horrible history. Um, and I want to, you know, my experience with the Zucker's case was so um, disorienting and made me realize that we need a way or a language even to think about you know, the proverbial end of this kind of reckoning, right? Not not the end of historical reckoning, never, um, or, and certainly not the end of memory, which we want to protect, but the end of a certain kind of legal engagement. Um, and I think it's a broader question that I see playing out in many other areas, right? I think with what is going on in Ukraine right now, the immediate impulse when crimes are perpetrated is, okay, how will we prosecute? And I think that is honorable and I support that. And I also think we need to be realistic about the limitations of prosecution um, and not place false hope in it. Um, and, you know, I think we can't rely on law to solve all of our moral uh, and political problems. And I see that happening in many areas. Um, and so that's kind of, for me, one of the primary things that I took away from this book, in addition to kind of what was really a quite difficult and frankly exhausting, uh, emotionally charged uh, investigation into my own kind of family history. I can imagine. Um Thank you for sharing all of that with us. And of course, listeners should very much read the book that goes into all of this in proper detail. Um, but before I let you go, now that this book is done, um, is there anything you might be working on, whether or not it's a book, whether or not it's on this exact topic that you'd like to preview for our audience? Yeah, I mean, I, my current project uh, very much grew out of this book because I became really interested in legal endings. Um, and it was actually while I was working on this that a German colleague of mine, a scholar, 
of um, German, German criminal prosecutions, we were having coffee and he said, you know, did, did you know that in every peace treaty before World War I, there was a clause called the Oblivion Clause and it precluded the possibility of prosecutions after the fact. Um, and it kind of, I had no idea. And so I started researching this idea of the Oblivion Clause and discovered that indeed there's this ancient tradition of oblivion uh, as a legal act, as a parliamentary procedure, you know, uh, listeners might know, you know, an act of oblivion is the thing that, uh, restored the British monarchy in 1660. Uh, and so my current project is thinking about what happened to this idea of oblivion and where it disappeared and how it might still be operative today. Okay. Well, that sounds fascinating. I'd love to see what comes of that project. Um, But of course, in the meantime, listeners can read the book we've been discussing titled Come to This Court and Cry, published by Public Affairs. Linda, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast. Thank you for your time.